Quantum computers destroying encryption, the shape of the universe, famous people I've met, and the cringiest video I've ever made. All that and more coming up in this month's lightning round video. All right, welcome back to this month's lightning round video. In case you're not familiar, lightning round videos are where I take questions from Patreon members and channel members who support at the solar system level or above. One of the perks that you get is you get to ask a question that goes into this lightning round video. And according to the new rules, I answer all of them. This is a new thing we're doing and uh, I've not seen any of these questions yet. So I'm going to answer them on the fly and any of them that I can't answer or I feel like I don't have enough information about, it'll go into a little ballot box. And at the end of the video, you guys get to pick out of that ballot box, which topics get to be made into a full video. Looks like we got seven questions today. That's, that's more than last time. So, so let's get into it. Gonna, gonna get comfy with my coffee. All right, Cole Parker asked, of all the famous people you know that I'm jealous of, uh, Felix, Scott M, Tim D, not JB, Andy W, Marcus H, and probably more, which one did you find even impressive in person than you thought they would be? I guess even more impressive in person than you thought they would be. Okay, so first of all, um, this depends on what you mean by in person, because only two of these people have I actually met, well, three, have, have I actually met in person. I haven't met Felix in person, although I've interviewed him for the podcast. Met his wife, Stephanie, at Tim Dodd's uh, Astro Awards. Um, Marcus House, I've never even, I've been on, uh, I, I went on somebody else's podcast where he was on there. So we actually did get to interact on that, but, uh, but I've never met him in person. Never been to Tasmania, so. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure who Not JB is. Sorry, I'm, I'm missing on that one. So the three that I have met, there's Scott Manley, Tim Dodd, and Andy W. I'm assuming means Andy Weir, the author of The Martian, who's probably watching right now. Hi, Andy. Um, so Scott, I only met in person for the first time at Tim's Astro Awards, and I really didn't get a chance to talk to him very much at all. It was a lot of chaos and everything. So uh, I feel like I didn't get a, a, a full-on impression of, of the full Scott Manley experience. Um, so that leaves Tim and Andy. Now, no offense to Tim, because <laughs> he's a buddy of mine, I love him dearly. Um, I, I'm, I'm super impressed by Tim. I've always said Tim is the, the, the nerdiest nerd who ever nerded. Um, he's a guy who was a musician and a photographer who just got into rockets and got so into it they became an expert. So, of course, I find that super impressive. Um, but I gotta, you know, I gotta hand it to Andy Weir because when I went out to California, and I interviewed him. Uh, we talked about all kinds of space stuff and it became clear very early on that this was not just a guy who wrote about science stuff. He, uh, he really knew his stuff. Being able to talk to him and get down on really technical levels, especially about, uh, well, and then I interviewed him later on the podcast for, we talked about um, uh, Project Hail Mary and getting into the very specific things. Like he literally took a, an, an exoplanet and it's in its conditions that, you know, scientists believe that, they're con that its conditions were. And he created a species and a society that would live there. Um, so yeah, he, he thinks on a level that most people don't. So I would, I'm not sucking up too hard here, but I gotta hand it to Andy Weir. He's, he's, he's quite a brain and a really impressive dude. I'm gonna get a text about that one. All right, next up, Robin Colburn asked, just wondering, in all these years of research, exploring, and the more than occasional deep dive, have you ever encountered new knowledge that was a real wow for you? As in, you were truly taken aback. Well, let me just, let me just comb through 10 years in my mental Rolodex of all the videos that I've done. I don't know if this is a good answer to the question, but there have been some videos that really changed the way I thought about things. I think the airships video, I refer to that one quite a bit. I had never given two thoughts about airships in my life until I'd made that video. And then I was just like all about airships after that. I thought they were so cool. Really wanted to see them make a comeback. Not that that was like new knowledge or anything. It was just something I had never really looked into. And once I did, I was like, this is fascinating and it's really cool. And I want to, I want to get on one. The other one would be, I guess, history videos tend to do that to me more than, than science videos, if I'm being honest. So many times when I look into some kind of history topic, I find an answer to why things are the way they are today, society wise, you know, that's always been like a big light bulb moment when I run across things like that. The spice trade video that I did that was actually about the, the Dutch East India Company. There were so many things in that video that I was just like, oh, that explains this. Oh, that explains that. Oh, that's why that happened. You know, it just kind of 
made all these you know dots come together just connected a bunch of dots in ways that i wasn't ever really familiar with before and um and maybe it's a bit more tangible because it is like explaining the world as it is today and i have been on a bit of a, a pressure changes everything kick over the last year or so like again it's just one of these things i never really thought about you never think about air pressure it's just it is all around you it's just what it is um but then once you realize that you know adding or taking away pressure actually changes the physical properties of things um when you think about science fiction when they go land on a planet they just kind of like look to see if it's got oxygen in the atmosphere well actually the the air pressure has a, <laughs> has a major effect on whether or not you can breathe that oxygen or not so uh that that's always something that, that cracks me up they never talk about that in uh in sci-fi movies and honestly, uh, you know, I did a tumbleweeds video recently, and the whole reason I did that video is because I was blown away to find out that tumbleweeds were a fairly new phenomenon in the U.S., and they don't even—they're not even native to here. They're, they're, they're so—they're so emblematic of the old West, but they didn't even show up until like the 1890s, and they're not from the U.S. They're from Russia. So uh, the whole reason I made that video is because I found a piece of information and was like, "What?" and just had to talk about it. So I don't know if that's the one specific example you're looking for, but that's that's a few examples that I can point out. And the great Brian Beswick asked, with almost two decades of videos, two, <laughs> what is your cringiest video? Oh, dear God. Um, yeah, yeah. This one isn't hard to answer. I know exactly which one just immediately popped into my mind. By the way, two decades of videos? Come on now. One way that I have changed throughout the uh, the course of this channel in the making of all these videos and researching all these topics and stuff, I used to be a lot more woo-woo. Like a lot more woo-woo than I am today. Uh, I still find those topics interesting, but I, I, would, I would approach them now with more of a skeptical eye and say like, hey, this is neat, but you know, you know, take this with a grain of salt and all that. There was, there was an interview that I did, and I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember the guy's name, but this was a long time ago. And he was working on a project i think it was called the human the global consciousness project and i still think it's interesting but it was this whole idea that that human thoughts and emotions could change random number machines so they were putting up random number machines all over the world to see if it was making differences in uh with with, with global events that happen and stuff like that it's still interesting but i'm a lot more skeptical of it now than i was back then but I remember interviewing him and I was t talking about how, like, you know, science has its own dogma. And he was like, oh, yeah, totally. And now I look at it and I'm like, eh. Now, I'm not saying that, that science doesn't have, you know, certain roadblocks and gatekeeping. There's definitely, you know, if you want to get published, you got to say something that falls into the scientific consensus. I'm not saying it's perfect. The scientific community is not perfect. But to say that science has its own dogma is... Uh, not a statement I would make today. Yeah, to be fair, I've said a lot of cringy things over the years. There's probably something cringy in every single video, but uh, I just think that my understanding of how deep a lot of these subjects go, now now I'm, I'm much more of a trust the experts kind of guy than I used to be. Okay, Fishtail asked, when quantum computers can factor numbers as large as 10 to the power 61, they can finally break modern encryption algorithms. What quantum resistant algorithms are you aware of? None. All right. So uh, I know Fishtail. He shows up in a lot of the uh, Zoom calls that we do. I know he's a cryptologist and uh, is is well uh, uh, familiar with these kinds of things. I am not. This is this is totally over my head. So I think we can firmly put this one in the ballot box. How how can we prevent quantum computers from breaking all encryption or something like that? That's in the ballot box. I got nothing. <laughs> John, or right-handed neutrino, asked, imagine that one of the galaxy clusters captured by JWST in one of those deep field images is actually our local group from such a long time ago that it looks unrecognizable. Thoughts on that? Think slightly positively curved space-time. So I guess the question is, are we seeing like a reflection of our own galaxy cluster from way off in the distance? Okay, so this question uh, confuses me on several different levels, but um, when you're talking about positively curved space-time, if I understand it correctly, that's more of like a, a hypersphere shape. So it's kind of like a balloon. 
And maybe you're thinking of like actually seeing across the balloon and seeing a reflection of our own local group, but it's from so far away. Uh, but the thing is about that hypersphere, you can't see through it. It's everything's on the surface. That's kind of the whole point. Like we can't even imagine going into the balloon if that's the case. So I don't think that's what you're talking about. When my the other confusion though is that if, if the JBST is seeing these old, old, old galaxies from really far away. I'm not sure how that could be our local group because they're close by, they're local. So I'm just gonna answer this by saying no. I don't think there's any way that it's our actual local group that it's seeing from, from very far away. I think I see where you're going with it, but I don't think that makes sense. Neat idea though. All right, Donna Sawyer asked, I've heard of alarming information about younger people in the job force not being able to save enough money to get things that used to be hallmarks of entering the adult world, cars, houses, etc. Yes, things are more expensive, but does this account for it? Anyone with an internet connection can order goods, place bets, donate, and get picked off by fraudsters. Is this the big reason over the prices of goods? Wow, getting into economics here. That's definitely not my territory. So this might be wearing my politics on the sleeve just a little bit, but... Um, you know, we, we had the pandemic and a lot of people, a lot of companies raised their prices because of shortages. There were legitimate shortages of supplies and stuff like that. And then after the pandemic was over, they never really put their prices back down. The prices never really go back down because once people get used to spending that money, you know, the companies aren't going to be like, okay, well, I guess we'll just make less money now when people are willing to spend it. That's, that's the funny thing about value. Uh, how we determine the value of things. It's basically things are worth what we decide they're worth. And if people decide, okay, I guess I'm fine spending this extra two or three dollars on chicken or whatever. Once they get used to that, that price isn't going to go back down. Oh, I guess without some kind of competitive market force or something like that. Tell you what, this feels like a big discussion point. Why don't I just open this up in the comments and let everybody talk about uh, why it is that prices have gone up so much recently. And also, this is one of those times that I'm actually glad that I'm the age that I am and I've gotten to the place where I don't have to enter the workforce anymore. Um, I do, my heart really does go out to people who are young right now and trying to get in there and are struggling to find a job. I, I keep hearing horror stories on TikTok about people applying for hundreds, even thousands of jobs and not being able to get it. Even though all these companies have these job listings, nobody seems to be hiring. I'm glad I'm not in that world, and my heart goes out to those who are. Although, if, if this channel goes sideways, I guess I could always wind up right back in that world. We'll see. All right, last question, last but not least, goes to Cy. His question is, given the coming changes from global warming, are you considering moving out of Texas? If so, where and why? This is something that gets talked about a lot in the Scott household. But if I'm being honest, I mean, one of the, I guess, the, the main reason why we have thought about moving out of Texas is just... I've lived here my whole life. I, this is the only place I've ever lived. This is the only culture I've ever known, and you know, in a, in a, in a living there kind of way. And um, you know, the world's a big place, and I wanna, I wanna experience more of it. But you ask where? Um, like I said, I mentioned the Great Lakes region. I mean, we, we've, we've looked in that a little bit. Um, we've also looked just in the, in the Northeast. Um, I have a lot of friends that live in Colorado, and so we, we thought about. Uh, spending some time there. Um, the only problem with Colorado is I know that the water issues there are not going to get any better. But um, yeah, I mean that's none of it. None of it is actually in the works right now. It's just it's just stuff we've talked about. And I'm, I'm actually I'm very curious if there's anybody else out there that's considering moving for that particular reason in the coming decades. Talk amongst yourselves. All right, thanks for all the questions, you guys. Those were a lot of fun. I hope I did them some kind of justice anyway, but I also want to take the moment in the spirit of, of thanking Patreon and members, of uh, thanking Patreon and members. So we got some new members to shout out real quick. We got on Patreon, Josh Pelle, uh, QPZ, Stefan Levy, Laura Rutherford, Bob Swaich, Weish, <laughs> Melly, uh, Jacob Skronek and Sven Hine, and then YouTube members that have signed up are Todd Hensley, Kristen Nothling, White Pappy 83, and Jackal J. Uh, thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them, get access to uh, exclusive live streams and early access to videos, all kinds of cool stuff, you can go to patreon.com/answerswithjoe, sign up there, or hit the join button down below to become a channel member. 
And please know that if you do sign up for Patreon, you won't be bombarded with emails because God knows we get enough of that already. And also, we won't sell your data to a third-party broker, which basically seems to happen every single time you buy something now. But if you want to get back at those less considerate people online, I can recommend today's sponsor, Incogni. So look, here's the deal. Around the internet, there are these companies called data brokers. And what they do is they buy data about customers from e-commerce sites. So thousands and thousands of people's names and the information about them. And then they take that information and they put them in different buckets. Buckets based on all kinds of things. Age, location, income, preferences. You might have a, a bucket for retirees in Arizona or college students who live near the water or new parents who have asthma. They get weirdly specific. But then they offer to sell those buckets to marketers who, you know, maybe do RV rentals in the Southwest or sell surfing accessories or an inhaler that stores diapers. That's a joke, but somebody should make that. So those marketers then, you know, buy those buckets of people and the junk mail starts flowing. The good news is you can get off of those data brokers databases. In fact, by law, they have to remove you if you ask them to. The bad news is there's literally hundreds of these companies. It would be physically impossible for you to reach out to every single one of them, much less follow up and make sure that they did it. But that's exactly what Incogni can do. They contact the data brokers and file data removal requests on your behalf. And then they monitor those databases to make sure you don't get back on there. Because let's face it, the only way to not get back on there is to never buy anything online again. And that's just not likely to happen. And you can follow the progress on an easy to use dashboard that shows how many removal requests they filed, how many are in progress, and how many were successfully completed. Oh, and they also get you off of what are called people information sites, which believe it or not, are available to the public. So it's not just some marketer trying to sell you something, it's scammers trying to steal your identity, even stalkers. Don't think about that one too much. But Incogni takes care of that, so, so you don't have to think about it at all. Just, just sit back and know that it's being handled and watch the number of spam emails go down for the first time in your life. Just go to incogni.com slash joescott to find out more and give it a try. And if you enter the code joescott at checkout, you'll get 60% off an annual plan. And you will want to do the annual plan. Um, it takes a little bit of time. Data brokers are like a bug infestation. It, it takes some time and maintenance. So one more time, that's incogni.com slash joescott. Offer code joescott at checkout for 60% off. I'll put the link down in the description. All right, thanks a lot for watching. Now go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.